Today, we sit down with the founder and CEO of G2 Capital, Jeffrey Unger. Jeffrey is a very accomplished CEO, director, and senior executive with experience in building scalable organizations across several sectors. Jeffrey also has significant experience working with private equity, venture capital, and debt credit financing. In today's conversation, we talk about why and how businesses get themselves into trouble, what they must do to get unstuck. Most importantly, what are the characteristics of healthy companies? The majority of entrepreneurs are unable to answer one very important question. What is your three-year capital strategy? We hope after this episode, you consider this question more seriously and make sure you have the right answer for the sake of your business's future. Enjoy the episode. Jeff, welcome to the Entrepreneurs United podcast. Thanks for coming on today. Can you please start off by telling our audience a little bit more about uh, G2 Capital, a little bit about your journey to founding G2 Capital? Yeah, absolutely. So G2 is a financial advisory firm and investment bank combined in one operational centric viewpoint. We started the firm a little over 10 years ago based on a very simple, crazy idea that we had that the world needed another version of an iBank. The reason we did this was that I spent the first uh, early part of my career really working in both CEO and founder led roles where I was working with different investment banks and different advisors looking for really folks that could be that true trusted advisor, whether we were raising capital or trying to sell a business or make an acquisition. And I kept having a very consistent message and theme in all of the different firms I worked with, which was I would get this great pitch from senior level partners and they would come in with all the different bells and whistles of an amazing pitch. And then a 23 year old analyst would show up and try to learn my business in my conference room. So throughout that time, uh, after going through that for probably the first 16 years of my career, I found myself in a situation where I was advising a company that got themselves in trouble and uh, ended up stepping in and taking a more active role from the board of directors position. And I went looking for a firm that could be that one-stop shop for this particular company. And I realized that it didn't exist Hmm. and that there was an opportunity to create something new. And so that's why we started the firm. It was to really try to develop something that the market hadn't seen before and to try to develop a deep moat around our strategy so that it could have a long-term sustainable plan. Thankfully, it's worked out. Here we are 11 years later. Awesome. And based in Boston, uh, but you have offices, I guess, uh, different areas across the country as well, right? Boston, Indianapolis, Chicago, and uh, San Francisco. Okay, great. So uh, is is it fair to say that your entry into this was uh, starting to work with businesses that have found themselves in a little bit of trouble and helping them out of that? Is that correct? Yeah, when we first started, the original thesis behind the strategy was that we were going to help companies that were going through some form of crisis, a form of distress, uh, and they needed help really kind of getting unstuck in whatever it was that got them into a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And when we got, when we first got started, we felt like we had a very strong value proposition in that marketplace and what you would call the special situations world. And what we didn't know at the time when we started was that the model that we were building would be very relevant for growing healthy companies as much as it was for companies that were going through that period of distress. Mm -hmm. And so about four years into our strategy, we pivoted and developed a dual strategy where half the shop is focused on distressed and and special situations and half the team is focused on companies that are growing and going through exciting growth curves. Awesome. So, you know, we've had a lot of conversations uh, on the Entrepreneurs United podcast about this COVID situation and how businesses find themselves in a little bit of trouble. And, and quite frankly, I'm a little tired of that conversation. Uh, and, and I think with you, we can have a different conversation, which is beyond economic factors like the Great Recession of 2008 or, you know, the COVID pandemic. There are many other reasons why entrepreneurs and businesses get themselves in trouble or they find themselves in a little bit of a crisis or need a little bit of a reset or get unstuck. What are the prime reasons you've found in your years of working in this industry that businesses find themselves in that position? Sure. So we've worked on over 125 different distressed companies over the last 11 years. And throughout that time, there are some very consistent themes that we find uh, throughout these organizations. Let me start by dividing them into two types of businesses. Let's start with first on one side, there's the private equity owned company. And companies that fall into trouble that are private equity owned to have a very discreet and different type of circumstance than if it's a family or entrepreneur owned company. Very different dynamics. So if it's a family or entrepreneur owned company, what tends to happen when a company like that gets into trouble is that they've either uh, had a significant disruption in their marketplace, either automation has come along and made a business obsolete, 
It could be a uh, multi-generational business that had uh, been very successful for the first two generations, and then the third generation comes along and uh, doesn't continue to innovate the way the earlier generations did, and they found themselves in a difficult market position. Number three that is very consistent is that uh, there, if there's a loss of a major customer that turns out was driving an incredibly large portion of the margin of the business, and that customer concentration, many, many small businesses have major customer concentration issues. Yep. And there's a, a real inherent risk in that, and that when you lose that customer, you know, John, as, you, as you've seen with some other uh, recent dealings that you and I have been involved in, that can have a tremendous negative impact on the company, especially yep. if there's too much leverage in the business. So if a company has too much debt and any of those situations take place, what you can really see is a perfect storm. So you see the semblance of too much debt, company disruption, or lots of major customer. And then you have a management team that's probably never been through a downturn and really never had to navigate those choppy waters. And so when you put all those topics together, you companies can find themselves in a very difficult situation very quickly. And then what immediately transpires is the challenge around liquidity. And everyone talks about liquidity and everyone feels like they understand how to run their business, but actually very few companies in America and probably around the world really focus day to day on their liquidity position, especially smaller companies. Mm. And especially when they get into periods of this type of moment. And when they do find themselves in that moment, these types of situations tend to be very, very challenging to navigate through when liquidity dries up. So those are some consistent themes we see on, on really the, what I would call the owner or family owned, owned business. On the private equity owned business, almost exclusively, the issues come from uh, too much leverage and too many acquisitions. So the private equity model is a leverage buyout model. So inherently it's over levered and or levered into go after growth. And as long as everything works in that strategy, as you're rolling up companies, that business model works really well as tremendous return for the equity investors and a good return for the management teams at work. However, if there is one acquisition too many built on a series of adjusted pro forma EBITDA analyses, and that's what you've been underwriting the credit and the balance sheet based on, and things don't work out as forecasted in the pro forma, the companies tend to find themselves in a really difficult situation where they have not four or five turns of leverage on the business but eight to 10 times or more uh, turns of leverage on the business. Hmm. And in those exact moments, what's, with, what gets really challenging is not only do you have the original family or the management team that run the company, you have the private equity firm that owns a big chunk of the business. And you also have a bunch of institutional banks and non-bank lenders that are now finding themselves in a position where the company is in default of their credit agreement. And there's a whole series of topics and challenges that come from those moments. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. There's a lot to chew on there for sure. Um, if I can, I want to come back to the, the first category you talked about, the family or entrepreneur run companies. And you talked about two things I want to kind of maybe come back to real quick. The first one was the, the customer concentration issue and how when you combine that with um, too much leverage or not enough capital, that that creates a little bit of a perfect storm type of situation, right? How can companies avoid that? Um, I mean, obviously the answer is diversify your customer base, but there's also another piece there, which is you know, the leverage and uh, liquidity issue in terms of where your small business should be. What do you propose, you know, if I'm listening to this episode as an entrepreneur, I should look at my business and think about this. H how would you prevent that storm from happening in your business proactively? Sure. So I think it starts with really a, a diversification strategy. Like you have to want to underwrite that as a core principle to your growth plan. And whether that means that over time you've grown up through a, on the back of a major customer or a client that you've worked with and you've enjoyed the benefit of that. A lot of companies we work with have a tremendous amount of business with Walmart as an example. Yep. And Walmart's great because they bring tremendous volume. The challenge though with working with a firm like Walmart is that sometimes they can look to improve their margins on your back. And so you could be growing additional SKUs with Walmart thinking everything's great, but then a new buyer comes along and says, well, you know that we need to take three cents off the price of your SKU. And if you multiply that across your business with multiple types of clients like that, and your 40% of your revenue is tied to Walmart, you're in a tough position. So the first thing that is, and I just, 
you really want to be thinking about diversification, not just from a customer perspective and a contract perspective, but from uh, how you look at the growth aspect of your business. And so it's easier said than done. And I understand that. It's one thing to say, it'd be great to diversify our business. But taking a long-term view on that and constantly chipping away at that, it's likely not going to happen with a light switch. It's going to happen over time. And so your ability to drive that thesis throughout your organization as a core central to who and what you are is absolutely essential. And I think the diversification aspect of that is one aspect. The other aspect to avoid and to truly to try to focus on is to constantly do exactly what Walmart has done to you, to your own internal aspect of your business. Yeah. How can you make your product less expensively? How can you improve your supply chain? How do you lower your costs? How can you automate your factory? And so constant innovation in today's market, in today's universe is absolutely essential. And I'll tell you that if you're not doing it, and you're a owner of a small to medium business, I promise you one of your competitors is doing it. Yep. And so you're going to wake up one day and you're going to find yourself in that moment and you're going to look to try to solve it and it can't be solved quickly. These yeah. are long-term, long-tail solutions. Yeah, no doubt. That's awesome. And just to recap that, when you talked about diversification, I think you said two things, right? One is not only diversify your customer base, but also diversify your segments potentially within your industry. And then the other part that I caught too on that was you know, be prepared for your customers to come clamp down on you potentially because other competitors of yours are being more innovative, more creative, looking to be more efficient in their cost structures where they can afford to get there. Is that a fair summary of that? that that's spot on. And, and honestly, if you wait for it to happen, yeah. it will inevitably happen. And so you can wait for it to happen and hope it doesn't. But I think we've all learned hope is not a strategy. So yeah. then it's, you can say to yourself like, okay, if, I'm, if a core ingredient in my products happens to be resin and the price of resin is dropping, I promise you that my end market customers are aware of that. So they're going to say, how come we're not enjoying the benefit in our wholesale price of your product that we're buying because resins dropped 40% 40, 40 in the last year? Yeah. The, your customers are savvy today. They know what's going on in the supply chain. On the flip side, if as it is today, the price of resin has risen dramatically, and you're having to push price increases through, then you you're need to get ahead of that in a way that uh, aligns with what's happening in the commodity marketplace. Yeah, that's helpful. I, along the lines of digging in on the family and entrepreneur side, another one of them that you mentioned was the next generation took over. I think we see that in small businesses, medium and large, that yes. those that own the business, if there's not a succession plan to someone else, that succession plan often comes to be the family. What have you seen on the healthy growing companies side of your business about how to successfully transition to the next generation? It's a great question. So what we tend to find is that there is usually an incredibly well thought out plan where uh, an owner is hoping to transition the business to their one of their children or one of their family members, broadly speaking. And they've really spent the time to think through that. And there's been a multi-year or even perhaps multi-generational game plan around those topics. The first question though that one has to ask when you walk into those situations is really to figure out, is the owner also the management team or is the owner an outside owner and there's a professional management team in place? If we, if we take the, the former where the owner is also the management team, and that person's gotten a little bit older and is looking to have uh, a transition of succession, but doesn't intend to have a, a, an exit strategy in the near term, then, and they don't have an obvious choice for that succession plan, um, we tend to find ourselves in a position where we spend a tremendous amount of time working with that owner to really define what exactly they're looking for in that next stage. And just as important, what is the role of that owner going to be during that succession plan? because it's hard for a lot of entrepreneur owner operators to hire either the next generation, even if it's a family member or a professional manager to take over the business and then to truly step away, right? I, I often refer to an owner operator as a professional whack-a-mole player, right? They can do virtually anything if you own and run your own business. You could take out the garbage, you can win a new piece of business, you probably can invent a new product. And likely you've done all that before 10 o'clock on a Monday. However, when they then have to hire a professional manager to come into the business and run it, uh, it's a difficult 
uh, release of letting go of the reins. And we see that challenge all the time. Thank you. When you started that, you said a really well thought out plan. What are the components of a really well thought out plan from what you see? So it really starts with what is it ultimately you're trying to accomplish and how do you define success? And that's different for every single company in America, right? Everyone has their own definition of success. Everyone has their own, their understanding and their complexity around how they're viewing that answer. Um, but it really starts the end game. So what we try to help our clients to understand is where are you trying to get to ultimately? Do you want to be completely removed from the business and hire a professional team? Do you want to play the role of chairman for a couple of years? How, what are you looking to do? Do you want to have a professional management team run the business for a few years? And then when your kids are older, give it, have your kids join the company? Like, what are the end games that we're talking about here? And until you know the answer to that question, you really can't build a succession plan. But once you define the answer of the, the topics that we just talked about, then you have to go backwards from that decision making, if you will, back to today, and then map a series of steps that drive you towards exactly how that's going to happen, whether that be how you're thinking about recruiting, how you're thinking about alignment with your family interests, if you're going to hold the business versus if you're going to have an exit strategy. So all those elements have to be answered up front. And you have to have some real frank discussions with yourself and your family to decide what it is you're looking for out of this transition plan. But if you're assuming someone's going to want to keep the business and, and, and they, are, they believe it's a generational type of business, then you're hiring professional management to become a steward of that business. And, that, and you realize that that steward who's coming in and grabbing the reins is probably going to take it for three to five years, maybe a little bit more, but there's a, it's a period of time. And after that, there'll be another steward that comes in. And I have a good friend that, that invested in companies that he believes that he can only invest in that will be around for at least 100 years. Now, obviously, he's not going to live to hundreds of years, but he wants to, his investment thesis is, I want to invest in businesses that never need to be sold, that are very good, solid, long-term businesses that have high sustainability to them and have long-term succession plans. Incredibly unique in today's world. But that investment thesis that he works off of uh, is fascinating when you think about the implications for what companies really fit into that category and how do families and owners think about those businesses. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of learnings that you can take away from those types of uh, viewpoints. If you don't mind, Jeff, just I have one more question down this particular rabbit hole, and then I have another area I'd like to ask you about. What I heard was define the future state. So how do you define success in your exit plan? And then I heard essentially define your current state and map out the steps from one to the other. Got that. Can you, for our listeners, talk about what are some of the steps that need to be mapped out? If somebody is an entrepreneur listening to this podcast and they're taking a few notes and they go, got it, I got to get really clear about what uh, an exit, a successful exit looks like. Uh, what are the steps now that I need to be really conscious of and I need a really well thought out plan in what? So you have to really think about your organization and what makes sense to take the company to the next level if that individual will no longer be at the helm running the business. So you have to look at what made that person successful to get to that point. Are you looking for a mini me version of the, of the entrepreneur who's saying someone who's just like me, who's scrappy, who's entrepreneurial, or are you looking for someone that is maybe filling the gaps of some of their areas of weakness that they could build on? So you really have to ask yourself some tough questions. I'm really good on the marketing and the product innovation side, but God, I wish I was better on the financial and operational side. So maybe the person that that person is looking for to take the company to the next level is stronger on the financial and operational side. It could be the inverse. So really figuring out kind of what's really needed in the type of individual in terms of the characteristic of the individual that you're looking to hire is based on your, the entrepreneur's own perspective and own strengths and weaknesses, but also where's the company at this point? Is the company running smoothly? Is the company still very much tied to the entrepreneur's sweat equity at the, on a daily basis? Where are they in terms of their level of investment, automation? How sophisticated is it? You know, a lot of entrepreneurs I meet have tons of great ideas. That doesn't mean that they're able to implement a lot of those ideas because it takes a different type of skill set. Even myself personally, like I have very specific areas after my 
almost 30 year career now where I know I'm very comfortable in my capabilities. But I will tell you that there's a lot larger of a list of areas that I could be much better in than I'm good at. And I, what I try to do personally is I look for people around my organization that will take on those areas that are much better in specific aspects of what I can do. And we're, it's complimentary for all of us. So I think if I was an entrepreneur and I was thinking about succession planning, I would look to figure out exactly what the strengths and weaknesses were I w- that I'm, I have. I would look for what I'm looking for the company to accomplish the next three, five, 10 years. And I would look to fill that gap analysis with the type of individual that could fit and fill those needs. And then through that process, um, it's one part analytical and what I would call kind of qualitative uh, aspects of personality and culture and what, you know, what type of message do I want to send with this type of leader that I'm hiring? And then the other aspect of it is quantitative. How do I measure effectiveness of this individual and what am I good at measuring and wh- what do I want measured in the future? So it really comes down to ultimately like you're answering some fundamental questions. What do I want to accomplish with the business if I'm not running it? What type of leader do I want to step into my shoes? What type of leader will the organization respond to? Because that's something that I think is really important. A lot of companies, a lot of owner operators will think that they need to go. They're ready. They've grown the firm. It's time to go hire the fancy guy in the suit with the fancy MBA. and We're going to bring him in here. Well, the reality is bringing in a certain type of individual to Chesterton, Indiana, in a you know, steel metal bending business may not be the right move, right? The cultural impact, it may just the system, if you will, within that company may reject that antibody, right? It just may not work. And I think that a lot of situations we go into, we see this exact situation where management or ownership has thought they needed to hire the, the sort of the polished pedigreed suit to come in and take over the business. And the reality is that uh, in many cases, culturally, it's not a great fit. And many times in, in the difficult situations we go into, it's because of that reason that the company finds themselves in difficult moments. I think it's an important highlight that you brought up. Look at the vision. What does a successful exit look like? Then immediately when I ask you, what are the steps you went to the leader, leadership, is what the, the business needs. So to decode what made the current leader successful, then you talked about organizational needs to be assessed. So what does the organization need? You spoke about culture. Look at that and what the organization needs. Look at the system. Look at innovation. Look at the type of leader that's going to lead those things. I think that was a, a really nice breakdown. Thank you for that. One other question I've got on a kind of a different line, when you were talking about the private equity side, you said there were two things, too much leverage and too many acquisitions. And it prompted my question on what are good acquisitions? How do you evaluate those? So on your side of the business, again, on the growing healthy company side, when you're helping those companies evaluate acquisitions, What's the positive side or what's the negative side on the companies that are struggling and uh, distressed? So I think the in- inherent macro theme of this topic is around the lack of understanding of the growth strategy versus the M&A strategy. The M&A strategy has to be a core aspect and a component of the growth strategy. And if you don't start with your overall growth strategy, your M&A strategy will be haphazard and opportunistic arguably episodic. So what our belief and what we've seen is that if a company has a really well-baked growth strategy, I look to grow through these channels, through these product areas, and I run my gap analysis saying I could do X, Y, and Z organically, but I could really do A, B, and C if I start to look for the right type of acquisition to fill those gaps, whether that's a go-to-market gap, whether it's a product gap or a capability gap. And when you start to figure it out from moving the pieces around a chessboard of a strategy, rather than just run out and start to make acquisitions for the sake of an acquisition, you start to put a very finely sharpened pencil on exactly the definition of a win in an acquisition. But then you have to overlay the specific deal very carefully, meaning that you can have a company that has 10 characteristics of what you're looking for in in a gap analysis you're trying to fill is part of your growth strategy. But if number 11 is that it doesn't have the right cultural fit to your business, you may be making a fatal mistake in the growth of your company. And I see that all the time where you look for something, you identify it, it's a good fit. 
it's the right criteria, the right end markets. It's a good fit for all the things you're looking for. You're able to buy it at the right price. You feel really good about it. You're super excited about it. And you kind of push the cultural point to the side because you're like, well, it hits all these char characteristics. I can get away with it. It's going to be really successful. 50% of acquisitions fail. Now, the definition of fail is really that they don't realize the value that is originally intended to be realized. That's, that's how people evaluate that statistic. And the reason behind it is people. It always comes back to people and culture. If a company isn't ready to be acquired, you're gonna have issues. If the buyer isn't ready to go and do the hard work of an acquisition and an integration plan, it's going to fail. And what we see all the time in these situations is that when companies are going through these moments, they're so enthralled on the idea of the transaction and the potential opportunity that it's the day before the deal is going to close and they're figuring out how do they want to announce it to the collective groups of employees. When, and I would argue, an integration plan should be done long before you get to the closing of a deal because you may say to yourself, well, if this integration isn't going to be successful, who cares if we get the deal done well or not? It doesn't really matter because as soon as the deal is closed, we're going to lose half our management team or we're going to have people on the company side that we just bought be disgruntled and upset with the situation. So really to me, it comes down to just a well thought out growth plan and understanding exactly what you want to buy and making sure that you're not just focused on the numbers and the aspects of the, of the operations of the business, but there's a good understanding of integration and cultural fit. Yeah, and Jeff, you know, we talked earlier when we were talking about the family entrepreneur side, their perfect storm, right? It's losing that big customer, being too leveraged. And if you look on the private equity side, you talked about the perfect storm being, yeah, you know, in private equity, you're going to have leverage. If you put on top of that failed acquisitions and or too many acquisitions based on, you know, the adjusted normalized EBITDA numbers and it doesn't hold. And then and I think you end up with a bunch of conflicts, right? The PE firm versus the founding partnership versus the banks. Uh, and everything ends up in, in chaos. And, and you know, certainly a lot of learnings to be had there. And, and when, I, when I hear what you say throughout this whole conversation so far, it, it just really has me think about, you know, what you're talking about is risk versus reward, right? What is your exit strategy? What is the reward? What are you trying to get ultimately for this reward? And what risk profile do you have currently but I think one of the problems that entrepreneurs have inherently is their mavericks. They want to go, they want to build, they want to create something big. And what, what seems to be lacking on the other side is assistance. And, you know, Rich asked a really good question, Rich. He said, well, what should they be planning if they're listening to this conversation? You know, what are the steps they should be taking in the planning? I have found myself over the years, and I know entrepreneurs do this all the time, they try and create that plan themselves. Mm -hmm. And this may be a little bit of a softball question, knowing that you're an advisory company that helps companies with this, but, but really, when should companies contact a company like G2 or anybody else for that matter and say, look, I'm looking to exit 20 years from now, but I want to create a plan. And here's, where, here's what I should be doing. What, when should they contact you? The year before they want to exit? 10 years? Five years? And, and what's the importance of that expertise versus going alone? Sure. So there, there's, and there's no one answer to that question that is perfect. There's nothing, there's no definition of perfect in this, in this talk track. But what I will tell you, I'll give you a quick little case study. So uh, last Friday, uh, I got on the phone with a, a company and a CEO of a good size, medium size owner operator business that I've been talking to for seven years and have spent a tremendous amount of time looking at their cap table, looking at their balance sheet, looking at the way that they are growing their business. And I uh, have never really engaged in anything formal. It's really been more informal, interesting conversations, getting to know one another a little bit. But it happens to be in an industry that we know exceptionally well. And he would reach out probably three to four times a year and talk through different aspects of uh, part of his plan and his growth plan. Never once did he come out and say, by the way, at the end of or the middle of 2021, I think I'm going to sell my business. Why? Because he's an owner operator who spends every day, all day playing whack-a-mole with a large good size, medium business. But then out of the blue, a week ago, he calls me and says, you know what? This industry is really incredibly busy right now. A lot of activity. I've been approached by a bunch of people in the last year. I really think it's time for me to consider an exit strategy. What do you think? And we started talking through different ideas. And I said, listen, I, and I said, the one thing I will tell you is that if a bunch of people are calling you, I would strongly recommend that you don't just reach out and just start giving information to lots of people. You should really figure out which advisor you want to hire and and make the decision and kind of go forward. 
And he said, Jeffrey, there's no other advisor. You and I have gotten to know each other. You know my business. I know you well. You've really been insightful and helpful on the way. You've never once asked for anything. And here we are, I'm ready to do something. And I always knew this day would come that we'd have these conversations. So whether it's an informal decision for that entrepreneur to make those calls a couple of times a year to reach out and to kind of quote unquote, pick our brain on what's going on in an industry or someone who's really seriously thinking about it and is saying, you know what? I think we're going to have to do something next two to three years. My, I'm the vice president of the company. My dad's the president. My dad's 75, wants to retire in the next five years. Uh, and we get those calls and we say, we want to plan. And how do we think about it? Generally speaking, it's kind of one to three years ahead of time is when the entrepreneur should really start thinking about this and contacting an advisor. It does not obviously have to be us, whoever's a good fit. But one thing I will say is that really like if you're in that moment, like really figure out how you're the definition of success for you. Is it succession to your next generation and you're going to bring in an investor or you're looking to sell the business and go to the beach? What is that exit strategy? And understanding exactly what that is will help any advisor devise the right strategy and plan for you. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. And I think one to three years is, is a good time. And I think it's important for entrepreneurs that are thinking about, you know, what their, you know, your exit plan changes. I, I know that several times you start a company, you think this is your exit plan. Five years in, you're thinking it's a different plan. So things evolve and change. I think having an advisor to talk to along the way, or just have somebody you can bounce things off of is really, really important. But uh, one to three years sounds good if you're looking to exit your company. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when you talked about, you know, we work with troubled companies, we work with good and healthy companies. On the good and healthy side, I'm assuming you work with companies that aren't necessarily looking to exit, but they're looking to take their business to the next level. I want to kind of maybe take our conversation there for a second. What are strong characteristics of companies that when you sit down with the entrepreneur, you say, don't sell this business, grow it. And here's why, and here's what you can do with it. What are the characteristics of that business? What does it look like to set up a business that can then take the next leap forward uh, with additional capital or other means? Sure. It's a great question. And we see it all the time. For, first and foremost, the, the sort of the pivot point in that question is really when you're looking at a business and you really see the runway, what does it look like? Is the runway, you've got a large addressable market ahead of you and you continue to uh, outpace the competitive landscape. You see lots of opportunity. You have the kind of the core competency of whatever it is you're doing, whether it be bending metal or providing IT services, whatever it is you're doing, if there's runway in front of you, then many times we're going to tell a company they should keep doing exactly what they're doing. Maybe invest in creating more infrastructure, maybe create more alignment with your management team. There are other elements of growth curves that one could do without having to go through a transaction. But if they're at a point where they're a platform and they're growing really well, growth costs money. Like I, I said to a client this morning in a, a high growth e-commerce company uh, that I'm uh, helping out a little bit with, and they're growing like a wheat. Like they're going to grow, I think, like five times top line revenue this year. And they're worried because they have to buy a bunch of inventory ahead of utilization of that inventory and processing and so on and so forth. A classic problem that every company has that has an inventory in their business. And I reminded them, growth is expensive. So what's the right way? If you have a dollar, how do you spend that dollar? And if you, you need $2, then what are you going to do? And how are you going to capitalize it? So there's something that we're constantly asking and driving home with clients about, which is, what is your three-year capital strategy? You've got a growth strategy, you've got a customer strategy, you've got a marketing strategy, but what's your capital strategy? And I will tell you that I am doing this for 11 years. I've never once had a client give me an answer. Never once. Because it's easy to look down three months, six months down the road. But when you're an owner operator playing whack-a-mole on a day-to-day -day basis, a three-year balance sheet forecast is incredibly complicated. It's complicated for us to do it, and we do it for a living. Tremendous amount of assumptions, tremendous amount of thought and discussion around what is life going to look like, what are raw materials going to look like, what are transportation costs going to look like. You've got to make some real assumptions. So, you know, if you're going to be opening up a new metal bending factory on the West Coast, and the cost of labor in California is significantly higher, but your market is there and your customers are dragging you there and they want you to be there, then you have to factor that into your long-term plan. And you can't just take the balance sheet that worked for you in Iowa and bring it to California. Cost of labor there is significantly more expensive, overheads more expensive. So you have to be thoughtful about these topics. 
these are good problems to have though. And I, I personally love these conversations because developing a capital strategy is me. It means that good things are happening, right? And how do we continue to help put that foot on the gas and help you grow faster? And if that means you need additional debt or additional um, working capital for the business, or you need to raise equity, any of those options and ideas are always on the table. Well, I think we found our, our title for this episode. What is your capital strategy? Because if no entrepreneurs can answer that question, they need to figure out how to answer that. I'd love if you could connect a dot for me on that note of the capital strategy with earlier, you said 50% of acquisition sale, which is uh, fail. Let me start that back over. 50% of acquisitions fail. Uh, and that's defined as they're not hitting the numbers that they projected. You then next said, it all comes down to people and culture. Can you connect the dot between people and culture and a capital strategy for us? So not an easy putt, but I'll give it my best. And so what I would say is that if I'm, if I want to take, let's say my own firm, take G2, let's say that G2 is as it is growing very nicely. We've gone from me alone in a room to now 50 plus people, offices around the country and worked on hundreds of transactions. As we continue to grow our business, what worked and what balance sheet supported the business to get to this point will not be the balance sheet that works for the next 10 years, Never mind the next two or three years. And so as we think about growth and we think about continuing to invest in people, offices, infrastructure, um, other aspects of our business that we're looking to invest in, that comes with a cost. And if I just take my current status quo and run it forward, it won't satisfy the needs of the business from a working capital perspective. So I have to decide where am I going to invest? And that's how every entrepreneur should look at growth. It's, it's an investment and they no different than they invest their 401k every day in their, in their different personal investment accounts. They should be thinking about how do I invest in my business? Am I going to invest and get a return in one year and two years and three years? And that goes back to the people question. Do I have the right people to make the investments? Do I have the right people to allow me to not just make the investments, but to execute upon the investments once I've made them? You know, those are the questions I think every entrepreneur should be constantly asking themselves. And as they think through the reality of the answers to those, I think they're going to look in the mirror and see that there's some real gaps. Everyone has a gap, everyone. And so the question is, recognizing where you're strong, where you're looking to grow, how are you going to augment your areas of weakness that you can improve upon? And how are you going to afford it when you want to get there? And do you have the right balance sheet to, to run it out forward? And if you don't have the right people and process and technology and infrastructure in place, then the lack of capital is the least of your problems. So you really have to start with those basic areas of focus and then overlay that with your capital strategy on top of it. So yeah. Not sure, Rich, I answered every aspect of that ticking a time that you were looking for, but yeah. hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, that was good. Um, you had said you'd focused on where to invest in that capital strategy with, if somebody says where I want to invest is in people or mm -hmm. where I want to invest is in culture, what does a wise investment look like from the businesses that you've evaluated? This specifically I would the investment in people and culture. How do you how do you make an investment in people and culture and have it be most likely to be a success? So in today's world, you would refer to that as talent management. That's the fancy word for that, which is a fancy way of saying human resources. So historically, human resources was benefits, administration, payroll management, all that kind of stuff. And that's all still important. But in today's world, if you're not investing in your talent management strategy about how you recruit, how you hire, how you train, when you train, who you train, do you train them internally? Do you use third-party training? How do you incentivize? How do you motivate? How do you inspire leadership? What kind of leader are you to your people? What kind of leaders do you want to grow within your organization? What type of you know, dynamics are you trying to create? If you don't set the tone as the owner and the entrepreneur in the business, then you are going to find yourself in a really difficult situation where people will take their own interpretation of all of that. And the problem with the interpretation aspect of that is that it becomes lots of little microorganisms running inside the body. Not a healthy way to grow a business. So wow, did you I think fire you're off a ton of questions. I, I couldn't take, you don't have to repeat them, but that came so naturally to you. You just rattled off like eight questions. And it's like, 
holy cow, if people don't have answers to all those questions, that would be problematic. And it sounds like that investment in talent management and then focusing where in talent management does a business need in order to hit that capital strategy. Would that be a summary of the direction yep. that you're headed in with an investment in people and culture? Absolutely. Yeah. I, Jeff, I, if I, I come back to this question you've posed entrepreneurs, what is your three-year capital strategy? And over the time that you've asked entrepreneurs this question, no one's able to answer it. That's a problem because uh, if, if I was listening to you speak right now, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm not able to answer it either. Uh, now what? What do I do? It's, you, you said it's even hard for us to do a three-year balance sheet forecast. So you can imagine it's hard for them. What actions should I take if I'm thinking about, okay, I need a three-year capital strategy for my business. Like what would be like the one, two, three, at least start here. So the first thing I would do is I would start with just a three-year P&L on my business, like a profit and loss statement, three years. What do I think I'm going to accomplish in terms of my revenue, my margins, and my earnings over the next three years? Okay. I would start with that, right? That, that's sort of the basis for everything. And are there aspects of that that are different than what I've done the last three years? Meaning, am I going to make a new product that I've never made before? Am I opening a new factory? Am I hiring a new group of people? What is it that's going to be different the next three years? And then those specific differences are areas to really dive into and figure out what's the cost associated with those changes and what is the margin profile associated with it? The holy grail, as we all know, in every company is margin enhancement, right? How do I improve my margins? Yep. And that's something that every entrepreneur worries about on a nightly basis. I worry about it on a nightly basis. And there are aspects of it, and it's whether it's automation or just better training to make people more efficient. There are elements to the business that are going to help you improve the overall effectiveness of your business. And so when you think about that P&L over the next three years, then you take your balance sheet and you say, okay, based on that three-year growth plan, what do I need to do and what do I need to invest in that I didn't invest in the last three years that's required? And when you overlay that against your current investment capabilities, whether that's your own checkbook, your bank line or some other you know rich aunt that's giving you money to grow your business whatever it may be you have to look at that and say am I, do i have enough capital in place to meet that goal and, and those objectives and if the answer is yes great awesome you, you should run some sensitivities just to make sure because it's a it's a forecast and the only thing i know about a forecast is it will absolutely be wrong okay. it can be directionally accurate but it will never be perfect because it's impossible. There's no crystal balls in business and it will be wrong. But directionally, it will be probably pretty accurate. But if the answer is, you know what? We're actually short a couple million dollars in year two and we're short even more in year three, then becomes a question of, okay, if I'm trying to accomplish this, this goal, the strategy that I've laid out, and I see that under the best of circumstances, I'm short, what can you do about it? You can go back and decide to write a bigger check and make a deeper investment. You can go to your bank, you can go to your other lenders, or you can go back to that rich aunt and you can get some additional capital invested, but you have to answer it now. And the problem that we tend to see is that people wait yeah. usually about a day too long. So they find themselves in a lot of trouble because they haven't, just like this company I was telling you about this morning, that's growing like a weed. They have to buy inventory and they're worried that they have limited capital to do all kinds of things, including now buying more inventory than they thought they'd need because they didn't have a long-term capital strategy. Never mind a three-year one. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are, these are all very kind of consistent themes that a lot of companies struggle with. And it's not unique. It's, it's a challenge. It's hard to do. And to be honest with you, most entrepreneurs, even if they're financially literate and, and savvy, it's, they don't want to really spend their day forecasting their business plan over the next three years. Yep. There's hundreds of things they could be doing that day that are probably in their mind more important. Yeah. And how to handle that gap. And it's funny because you, you said, how do you handle that gap and then answer it now? <laughs> because as an entrepreneur, you live for tomorrow some days, right? You're living for that month. You're living for the next month. We'll figure out how to get that, you know, in a few months from now, something else may change. And you make a really good point that if you don't answer it now and have a plan for it, you know, you may get that, uh, you know, coming a, a day too late uh, to, to figure out what you're going to need to do. So that's very, very helpful. Um, 
Jeff, I really appreciate all the, the, you know, information you shared with us today and what you're seeing. If you had to boil it down to one macro concept that entrepreneurs either really need to get right or can't mess up in order to have a successful enterprise, what is it ultimately that, that one macro level concept? I think it's leadership. I really think everything else can be fixed. I think you can fix your go-to-market strategy, you can fix your factory, you can fix your logistics, you can fix your supply chain. You can't fix leadership. What, if you lose on leadership, it's, it's virtually impossible to fix. And, and that, is, it, that is not a single source response, meaning like you, it, there's no one answer to that. Some leaders are very effective one way and some leaders are effective other ways. Everyone has to decide what kind of leader they are and make that just tried and true to who they are and what they're trying to accomplish. Personally, I feel like empathetic leadership is, the, is, I think, a very effective form of leadership because you're taking the time to really understand and kind of um, what everyone else is dealing with and how they're dealing with situations and really look at the human side of things. But in some cases, that's not effective. Right? You just, it just doesn't work. There's no right or wrong answer, but it does come down to leadership. Leadership to me is everything. And if you can get leadership right and you really invest in your own training on your own personal leadership, whether that's working on the way that you communicate, the way that you um, look to incentivize people or the way that you want to create a strategic vision around all of that, uh, that that's really ultimately what I think leadership is all about. Stick around with Rich and I for a few more minutes while we break down the podcast. Rich, what is your capital strategy? Really, I think would stump, just like Jeff said, 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs. They all have their growth plans. Talk, ask any entrepreneur in the world, where are you gonna be in three to five years? They can tell you exactly how they're gonna grow their business, how much revenue is gonna grow. But can they tell you exactly from a capital perspective, will they have the means to get there? And one of the things that has been really uh, prominent, I think, through this whole COVID crisis and other things is uh, there's the saying that I learned from uh, the group at Scaling Up, the Growth Institute, which is, you know, revenue is vanity, right? Profits is sanity, but cash is king. If you don't have the cash to invest and reinvest in your growth plan, you're screwed. So I would really challenge entrepreneurs listening to this. If you do not have a three-year capital strategy, how are you going to figure that out? get some help, your CPA, groups like G2 Advisor, somebody to figure out, do you have the right capital strategy to match your growth plan? And I love his answer to your question of, hey, what are just a couple of steps? Like if somebody's not going to go get an investment advisor, he said, do a three years of P&Ls, look at what's different, then look at your balance sheets for the next three years, look at the growth, and do you have enough capital? And you emphasize this on the podcast with him. If you don't have enough capital, answer now what you're going to do. Don't wait for the pain point of, hey, here's a really good opportunity or here's something really painful. I need money. What am I going to do now? Answer it now. Well, you have the time to be looking at P&Ls and balance sheets and you're not in the trenches fighting fires and you have the time to do that. Go that extra step. Answer now how you're going to get the money you need for the growth that you seek. Yeah, absolutely. And if you combine that with the conversation we had with Manny Pata on this podcast episodes ago, and his comment was, don't go look for investors when you need money, right. right? And you combine those two theories. If you know in your growth plan that your capital structure is showing you might need some help, wouldn't it be a great time to then take your capital structure to an investor or investors or different groups and say, I'm not looking for money. Can you look at our capital plan and let me know what you think? What am I missing? What do you think? Any advice? And start building that relationship as opposed to waiting for that moment a day too late, like you said, which is typically what happens to entrepreneurs. You win this big contract. I'm like, oh, now what am I going to do? That kind of goes back to that networking component. If you have a capital structure and you have visibility, a line of sight that you may need help down the line, you can start building those relationships. When you said if you have a growth plan, boy, the first thing I thought of is a lot of growth plans just look like a line straight up. I think mm -hmm. an accurate growth plan includes a down year every yeah. now and then. There aren't many companies that never experience a down year. And if the growth plan goes straight up and there's never a plan for a down year, that's when that's a distressed company. That's when you end up going to G2 and you're on the side of the 125 companies that Jeff has dealt with that are distressed companies. 
yeah. from not having planned on what am I going to do in a down year? How am I going to get capital then and get it now? Yeah. You know, he talked about on two sides, you have the, you have the entrepreneur slash family owned business and you have the private equity led businesses. And he spoke yeah. about two, you know, let's call them perfect storms that happen on both sides of them. And unfortunately I've seen them uh, myself, whether it be personally experienced or through other people, those perfect storms happening. Uh, and sometimes you survive them and sometimes you don't, which is actually what makes entrepreneurism so tough, so difficult is as an entrepreneur, you meet these storms, whether it be pandemics or recessions or loss of a key customer and all those different types of things. But it is capital planning that gets you away or you know, to, to survive from them ultimately. Even if that's emergency capital planning, it's still capital planning. Like as an example, I can remember in 2008, uh, we were working on a business that, that had a big customer go bankrupt and a big bad debt allowance came in. You weren't expecting that in your capital plan but you had to figure it out. And I remember then, you know, readjusting the capital plan so we could make payroll every week and that business survived and flourished and did really, really well, but it could have died in that particular moment. So there's that perfect storm. And then you have the perfect storm on the private equity side as well, where there is a lot of capital coming in, but one or two or three things go wrong and it creates dysfunction in the relationship and the whole thing falls apart. Those perfect storms are dangerous. And, I, and it, it, to me, it all, it came back in this whole conversation to, what is your reward? Why are you an entrepreneur? What are you trying to get to? And are you doing the proper risk mitigation analysis along the way? You know, what's your plan for that? You know, based on some of my passions, I can't help but double down on the fact that we have a guy who's a chairman and a CEO of a capital advisor company that has four offices around spans east coast to west coast and the last question you ask him is what is one thing that every entrepreneur knows and this guy is like he's trained he's a near genius in in money capital advising and his answer is leadership it wasn't anything about capital or capital advising it's leadership and i happen to agree with him and, and although this wasn't a podcast all about leadership for him to end with that type of punctuation, uh, at the end of this podcast, I think it really makes a statement. And it wasn't the first time he made a nod to it when he said 50% of acquisitions fail and it's all people in culture. That's it. It's all people in culture. And, uh, and I, I have to agree. Well, yes, capital planning is incredibly important. It, with the wrong leadership, it doesn't matter what your capital is. <laughs>